Hi everyone, welcome back. Hopefully my voice is getting better. Um, certainly the nastiness, uh, the flu, the coughing that I had last week is not nearly as bad. I still have a little bit of congestion, so please bear with me. My voice is still a little jacked up, but not as bad, hopefully. Uh, hopefully by the time we get to next week's lectures, everything will be back to normal. Okay, so what are we talking about this week? This week we're going to talk about federalism. We're going to talk about the federalism as it existed when the Founding Fathers first wrote the Constitution and federalism as it exists today. Those are two very different things. And we're going to talk most importantly about why the nature of federalism in America has changed. So let's start with sort of the dry, boring stuff, just the definitions. Uh, what do we mean by federalism? Federalism simply means sovereign power divided across political units. Political units in America are national government, Congress, the presidency, state governments, the governor, the state legislature, um, and also local governments, the city council. Those are three different levels. You've got the national, the state, and the local level. We're going to primarily be talking about national versus state powers. But basically what it means is that national government has some powers that are sovereign. State governments have other powers that are sovereign. What do we mean by sovereign power? We simply mean power that is exclusive uh, to the political unit, exclusive authority or autonomy of one of these political units. Here's an example. The Constitution gives Congress the power to declare war. Only Congress has the power to declare war. A state, for instance, Wyoming, could not declare war with Canada. I'm not sure why you'd want to declare war with Canada, but, you know, if Wyoming ever did decide that, they don't have the power because the Constitution only gives that authority to Congress. So the power to declare war is an, uh, an authority or a power that is only granted to the national government. That's what we mean by exclusive. Now, federalism is often cast or portrayed in, with different visuals. There's layer cake, there's marble cake, there's picket fence federalism, there's even a coercive versus cooperative federalism. You can see the, uh, the cake and the picket fence here. And there's all of these different types of federalism. For this class, though, the most important thing is that there has been a change over time from what we call dual federalism to cooperative federalism. We're going to talk about what each one of those are. But the theme of the entire lecture is going to be um, the shift from a dual federalist relationship to a cooperative. Another way to think about it is from layer cake to marble cake. The layer cake, of course, has layers that are separated by icing. The marble cake is all mixed in. Those are roughly analogous to the two different types of federalism that we're going to talk about. Okay, let's first talk about dual federalism. Dual federalism refers to a situation where national and state powers are distinct and separate. It means exactly what you think it means, right? Again, Congress and only Congress has the power to regulate the army. The states and only the states have the power to determine drinking age. The federal government, Congress, cannot pass a law that says that there's a national drinking age. Now, they can coerce states today into increasing their drinking age voluntarily. Um, we'll talk about that uh, a little later in the lecture. But formally, in terms of institutional powers, a state cannot determine where an, uh, troops in the army go during a war. They cannot declare war. Um, only Congress can do that. And Congress cannot write laws that create a national drinking age because that's not a power enumerated to it in the Constitution. That's something left only to the states. So as we talked about last time with the U.S. Constitution, the national government can only do what is enumerated to it under dual federalism. If it's not enumerated, then states and only the states have that authority. So a lot of this, a lot of the debates about federalism, gets wrapped up in the Commerce Clause. Now, you do not need to know the quote from the Constitution, but I put it up here to give you a sense of what it says. The Commerce Clause is uh, part of Article 1, Section 8, that says that Congress has power, power, quote, to regulate commerce with foreign nations and among the several states. What, is the, what does among mean? The Supreme Court over the years has interpreted it to mean interstate commerce, not intrastate. Interstate simply means commerce that exists between the states. So, for instance, if something is shipped from Colorado to Wyoming, that crosses state boundaries, that is interstate commerce. 
intrastate commerce that only occurs within the boundaries of Wyoming is left to the states under dual federalism. Here's an example. The, Ford, the Affordable Care Act, also known as Obamacare, is a controversial policy, health care policy, enacted by the Democrats and President Obama. And the fact is that insurance is only sold within state boundaries only. You typically cannot buy health insurance from the state of Colorado. You can only buy health insurance from companies that are located in Wyoming. There are national companies that have um, conglomerates in each one of the states, but typically you have to buy a, from a company that is operates within that state. What that means is that under dual federalism, Congress does not have the authority to regulate inter, or intrastate commerce, the commerce that only happens within state boundaries, and therefore the law is unconstitutional. Yeah, that's right. Under the notion of dual federalism, the Affordable Care Act would be very clearly unconstitutional because insurance is not something that occurs across state boundaries. Now, why does Congress today have the authority and why has the Supreme Court allowed it to do that? We're going to talk about that at the end of the next lecture. But it's important to note that, as we'll see later, legal challenges to the Affordable Care Act or Obamacare are based on these notions of dual federalism. And, in fact, there is a long-running dispute over the Commerce Clause that is the basis for a lot of ideological debates today. Issues that range from abortion to gun control to regulation of commerce to advertising to marijuana policy to health insurance, car insurance, you know, all of these are things that are rooted in this debate about the Commerce Clause and concepts of federalism. So that's dual federalism. Let's turn around and talk about the, uh, the opposite of it, which is cooperative federalism. To understand cooperative federalism and where it came from, we have to go back to the Great Depression. As many of you hopefully know, the Great Depression was the largest economic disaster the country has, frankly, ever seen. There were huge numbers of people unemployed. Uh, the stock market crashed. There were people that were laid off. They lost everything, their homes, their jobs. Um, people had a really hard time at the, during that era just feeding themselves and their family. The Great Depression forced people, the public, and also the politicians to rethink the nature of federal versus state um, relationships. They forced them to rethink the classic notion of dual federalism. Here are some images from the Great Depression. You can see the, uh, just the abject poverty that occurred. Uh, this is an interesting sign that was in a city, it said jobless men keep going, we can't take care of our own. Notice who posted that sign, the Chamber of Commerce. The, uh, I think that's interesting because today Chamber of Commerce is um, a very active group that promotes the interest of business. Uh, but even at the time during the Great Depression, the group that was promoting business was having to put up signs telling people there are no jobs here, please keep going to the next town. And, of course, there are very, very long lines for, um, for things like just food, free coffee and donuts for the unemployed. You can see in the picture here the very long lines for it. So I want to give you a sense of just how economically drastic times were, and which is why it forced the, uh, the public to rethink this. Frankly speaking, the states could not handle the unemployment. Um, there were state... Uh, state-initiated welfare programs, poverty relief programs, but the federal government had a lot more resources than the states did. The states uh, did not have the resources to provide poverty relief or even jobs to all the people within their state, so they began looking to the federal government to provide national resources to help. This opened up the opportunity for a new type of relations where the federal government took the lead on things such as jobs programs and poverty relief, and the states began having a diminished role. And the state role was, frankly, mainly to implement federal policies. It was not to enact or create new policies to address the unemployment and the economic disaster. It was to help implement and execute the policies created at the federal level. That's what we mean when we say the federal government took the lead in this new uh, role between the federal government and the states, this new type of federalism. So... Cooperative federalism is often what we call marble cake or picket fence. Pick whatever analogy helps you, but the main point is this. 
It is a situation where the federal government takes over policy areas that are usually left to the states. And the states cooperate with the federal government to enact those policies. So for instance, the government might provide a block grant to the state of Wyoming to be used, um, and Wyoming would determine how, who gets the money and how they get the money. But the state there is simply implementing a policy enacted by the federal government and helping to distribute resources provided by the federal government. What that means is that boundaries between these political units, national and state governments, becomes very blurry. This wall uh, between the federal government and the state government, the wall between federal power and state uh, power that we see in dual federalism is not absolute. Um, and a lot of this to understand why there's been this blurring of lines has to do with ambiguity in the Constitution. Now, the Constitution, the Founding Fathers did actually leave parts of the Constitution ambiguous. They left it for future generations to interpret. Um, there's wide variation on which parts are ambiguous and which parts are very clear. A, probably the clearest example of ambiguity in the Constitution is the cruel and unusual punishment clause. Congress cannot uh, and government cannot enact penalties or punishments that are cruel and unusual. But what does that mean, cruel and unusual? Certainly, the definition of cruel and unusual today is very different than when the Founding Fathers wrote the Constitution. And notice that the Founding Fathers did not have a list of punishments. They did not say this type of punishment is forbidden or this type. Uh, they simply said cruel and unusual, and they left it to future generations to, um, to, to interpret that. And so they allowed the Constitution to change. So ambiguity in the Constitution does allow some of the relationships between the federal government and the state to become more blurry or to change over time. Now, there are other parts of the Constitution that are very, very clear. For instance, even the most um, liberal individual would certainly not argue that the two-year term for members of the House of Representatives could somehow be interpreted as three or four years. The Constitution is very clear that members of the House of Representatives go up for re-election every two years, and I don't think anybody believes that that's in any way ambiguous or can be reinterpreted. And so, again, just some parts of the Constitution, the Founding Fathers were very, very clear, other parts they were less clear about, and that ambiguity is what opened up, for good or bad, has opened up the opportunity for the classic notion of dual federalism to change into this cooperative form. So that's the background on federalism. I've shortened, uh, divided the federalism uh, lecture into two different parts. This is part one. Next, uh, the next part, we're gonna talk about the causes of this change. Why specifically did we see a change from dual federalism to cooperative federalism? We're gonna go into very specific detail about that, and then we're gonna have some examples of current debates that are wrapped up in this notion of federalism. So that's it for now, see you next time.